Greetings and welcome to the Obscure Room. I'm that biomechanical dude and in this show I'll be reviewing obscure retro games, whether they're good, bad or just okay. Today we'll be taking a look at a game in the adventure genre. Whether they were text-based or used a point-and-click interface, adventure games dominated the PC market back in the 80s and 90s. Classics like the King's Quest series and The Secret of Monkey Island have left a permanent mark on the video game industry. When it comes to more obscure titles, however, a lot of them have something very unique about them to set them apart from the competition. And today's game is definitely unique. This is Darkseed. The game was released by Cyber Dreams in 1992 for MS-DOS and the Commodore Amiga. What's particularly interesting about it is the fact that it features the artwork of the great H.R. Geiger, who's famous for his unique biomechanical style and for designing the iconic Xenomorph from the Alien movies. The game was moderately successful and soon had ports for the PlayStation and Sega Saturn, although they were released only in Japan. There was going to be a version for the Sega CD, but it was unfortunately cancelled. I'll be looking at the MS-DOS version because... That's the one I have! And besides, the ports are almost identical to the original, so everything said here should apply to them as well. The plot follows Mike Dawson, a writer who has just bought an old Victorian house in the small town of Woodland Hills. Once he moves there, however, he starts having terrible nightmares and even worse headaches. My head feels like it's going to explode! After exploring his new house, he discovers stuff like a secret passage in the study, a strange mirror in the living room with a piece cracked off from the corner, and the diary of the previous owner, who also seems to have had splitting headaches himself. There, he describes his experiences in a place which he refers to as the other side, and strange aliens known as the Ancients. As Mike investigates what exactly happened, he receives various items through the mail, including a glass shard, which turns out to be the cracked piece from the mirror. As he places it back, this happens. God, I love this sound. Mike soon discovers that he could go through the mirror and he ends up in a nightmarish dark world, which seems to reflect ours. This is the outside of the alien edifice. It reminds me somewhat of the front of my own house. Now Mike must find out what this place is, who the ancients are and what is going on. The story is simple yet effective enough. It has a bit of a Lovecraftian vibe to it which fits well with H.R. Geiger's otherworldly designs. Not to mention that one of his influences are, in fact, H.P. Lovecraft's stories. Another interesting thing about the game is Mike Dawson himself. If you look at the credits you'll see that the game designer is... Mike Dawson. Yes, the designer is the main character. Apparently the whole thing started off as a joke when there were no ideas for a main character yet. But as the game was being made, the team decided to go through with this and so Mike Dawson became the protagonist with the game using digitized images of him for the sprites and his voice for the character's dialogue. Of course, the game's main selling point are the graphics. Besides using H.R. Geiger's artwork, the game utilizes a much higher resolution than any other adventure game at the time. This was actually demanded by Geiger himself because his artwork wouldn't have looked as good on the standard lower resolution. In my opinion, he was absolutely right. Geiger's artwork is very intricate with lots of little details, so the higher the resolution is, the better. And I have to say, all the designs have turned out very nicely. The Dark World looks good and the game preserves the look and feel of the artwork. The locations in the normal world are also very well made. The music is pretty memorable in my opinion. While it may not be catchy like a lot of famous video game soundtracks, it's very atmospheric, matching the mood each location creates from the sunny suburban area to the strange and desolate dark world. The tracks you hear in this video are all from the Amiga version. The DOS version, particularly the one that came on CD-ROM, uses MIDI music, which should be good considering how versatile MIDI is. However, it's very poorly used here. Let's hear the Dark World track again, this time from the DOS version. Ugh, it's putting me to sleep. 
The DAS game has another rendition of the soundtrack in the floppy disk version. This one uses the AdLib sound card. It's a bit better than the MIDI version, but it's still kinda... Uh... Seriously, what's with this instrument? It sounds like you'd hear it in a rap song or something. Yeah. Uh. Dark Seat Pete gonna wreck your beat with his dumb ass rhymes and his big ass feet. Turn my headphones up. Okay, I apologize. I'll never rap on this show ever again. Another interesting thing to note is the voice acting in the CD version. There's not much actual dialogue, so you mostly just hear Mike commenting on pretty much everything. And I do mean everything. This town looks unnaturally quiet. Reminds me of my last garage. Here's an old trench coat. I wouldn't be caught dead in that thing. The road seems strangely empty and unoccupied. Now, you might think this would be very annoying to sit through, but it's not bad at all. He only comments on the new stuff he finds and talks in a mostly bland, monotone voice, so it kind of feels like an audiobook or something. This, however, can be bad for the game's atmosphere, particularly in the dark world where despite there's all this weird sh** that he encounters, he doesn't seem very phased by it. All my gut feelings tell me not to go in there. However, nothing ventured. Sometimes he'll even explain things which he doesn't have any information about. This looks like some strange abode of a biomechanical leech, draining the life force from its victims. Look at those poor unfortunate victims of that life force leech. How do you know all that? At other times, instead of Mike, you hear this woman describing everything. An unnatural glow emanates from the chamber. Strange machines provide energy, nourishing the creatures cocooned in their sacks. Okay, so does Mike hear this voice in his head, or did the game developers just decide that these lines wouldn't fit with his character, so they just gave them to someone else? It's especially unsettling when you hear the voice when trying to touch the gravestones in the normal world. Don't disturb the dead. Step back. You're on hallowed ground. Then there are the other characters who all have short lines, but they made sure to overact as much as they could. That's the last bottle of scotch. Boy, Delbert's gonna be mad. So that's where my gun went. You're going to rot for a few centuries, human. The game plays like any other adventure game. You explore the world, find items, then use them to solve puzzles which would progress the story forward. At the start, the game immediately throws you into one such puzzle. Mike wakes up with a monster headache and you have to find some way to relieve the pain or he'll nag you about it. My head is killing me. My head feels like it's going to explode. The game doesn't really give you any clues about what to do. You have to know to look in the bathroom where you will find some headache pills. You also have to know to take a shower because for some reason Mike smells terrible and you won't be able to enter any of the buildings in town. And of course, the game never tells you this until you actually try entering them. I can't go in there without showering first. After you've done all that, you have no idea where to go or what to do. There are a few points like that in the game, but they're usually solved by exploring the area and finding a clue of some sort that would lead you to more stuff to do. This is all fine, after all, exploration is a huge part of adventure games, but there's one design choice that ruins it all. The time limit. You have three days to beat the game with each hour lasting about two minutes. If you're in the house at the end of each day, Mike will go to sleep. If you're outside, however, you will pass out and on the next day, all of your items will be taken away. Each day you have different stuff to do with the exception of taking a shower and the headache pills which you have to do every day. Of course, it's never really clear what specific thing you have to do each day, so you might miss something important on one day and even though you can discover it on the next, you will waste a good amount of time. There are also events that take place at certain points in time. If you miss these events, you might miss important items and clues. All of this makes you rush through everything, hindering exploration. This is especially bad when key items are hidden, like the gloves in the car's box or the secret passage. And sometimes, items can be too well hidden. Do you see this small blob of pixels on the floor here? That's actually a bobby pin. Yeah, that's right. 
and you absolutely need to pick it up because it will be important later on in the game. Couldn't they at least make it sparkle or something so you can notice it? Then there's this library card. It's in the pocket of this old trench coat and you have to examine it twice in order to find the card. The question here is, why do you have to examine the trench coat twice? The trench coat itself is nothing out of the ordinary so nobody would think to examine it twice. And the library card is, once again, an important item. The puzzles in the game also have some problems. Now, you might think that simply knowing the solution to a puzzle will let you solve it and you don't need to find clues every time you play. That's how it is with most adventure games. Not with this one, though. Here, Mike has to know the solution, too. That means that you have to get every clue to certain puzzles in order to solve them. For example, I know that there's a pair of car keys under this flagstone. Mike, however, doesn't know that yet, so you can't pick up the flagstone. You have to look at the microfish in the library that tells you and Mike about this. From what I can tell, this is just made to prolong the game. As the puzzles aren't actually that many, nor are they hard, but it definitely makes the game more annoying. While most of the puzzles are logical, there are still some bullshit ones. At one point, you get arrested and put in jail in the normal world. Before being released, you have to hide your most important items, including the bobby pin, under the pillow. Not only that, but you have to steal the gun in the police station, even though nobody would think to do that after just being released from prison. Once you go back to the dark world, you have to go to the police station's counterpart. The main lobby of an alien jail. They could use a new decorator. <laughs> okay, that line was kind of funny. Once inside the police station, you get arrested for big shock stealing the gun. Then, in the prison cell, you have to get all the items you stored under the pillow, you can use the bobby pin to escape, and then give it to another prisoner who will give you an invisibility ring that you would need later on. How are you supposed to know all that? A lot of the stuff you are expected to do go beyond the realm of common sense, and the only hint you get to hide your items, go to the dark world and turn yourself in, is a message you receive over the car's radio. Turn yourself in and leave behind the key which will only work in the dark world. And you can only get it on the second day, so if you check the radio before, only to hear some music, you wouldn't think to check it again. On top of all this, you have to be careful when interacting with certain objects because you might die. This is common in adventure games. The problem here is that, most of the time, the game doesn't convey the danger of these objects. This lever, for example. You have to pull it to open a door, but it has electricity running through it, and if you touch it with bare hands, you'll get shocked. You have to know to put on the gloves before pulling it. But there's nothing in the game hinting at the electricity running through the lever. A good practice in adventure games is to save often. Here you have to make sure not to save too often. Failing to find important items or doing certain actions may lead the game to an unwinnable state. For example, once you find yourself in the Dark World prison, if you don't have that bobby pin under the pillow, you might as well quit the game because you're stuck in there forever. At other times, you might think you've done all the necessary things on one day, but on the next day you'd find out that you've missed something and you can't go back for it. Unless you know exactly what you have to do, all of this can make the game incredibly frustrating. It's now time to talk about the final part of the game and the ending, so there will be some major spoilers. Click here to skip to the end of the review. After exploring the dark world, investigating what happened to the house's previous owner and going through all that prison bullshit, you use the invisibility ring to get past the sentry and enter the archives, the dark world counterpart of the library. There you meet the Keeper of the Scrolls, a friendly alien who has been sending those messages over the radio. She tells you about the aliens known as the Ancients. They want to take over the Earth, and to do that, they've implanted an embryo in Mike's skull. Once the time runs out, the embryo will hatch and will destroy humanity. Now it's up to Mike to find the Ancient's power source and use it to stop their plans. On the third day, you receive an axe handle through the mail. You have to explore the dark world a bit to find the power source. Again, you don't have much time to do so, and even after that, what do you do? Well, remember that flagstone which you had to pick up to find the car keys? You can put that in the hole and it becomes energized. Then you can combine it with the axe handle to make a glowing hammer. 
you can now enter the ancient ship and engage the startup sequence. You have to get out of there as fast as possible. The ship flies away and you go back to the normal world again. The last thing to do to stop the ancients from entering our world is to break the mirror with the glowing hammer. After that you get a visit from the librarian who found a prescription for your headache pills in her purse. Then this happens. I'm just beginning to understand. Okay, what exactly is that supposed to mean? That the dark world is a mirror image of ours? Well, that became obvious before. Is the ending telling us that the Keeper of the Scrolls is the Librarian's Dark World counterpart? Is it hinting that the Dark World isn't real and it was all in Mike's head? Well, never mind, Mike decides to sell the house and the game ends. What about the embryo? I suppose it died because of the pills? The game never really explains. Whatever, we beat the game, so yay, I guess. So that was Darkseed. It was actually okay. I have to admit, I have a soft spot for this game. Being a big Alien and HR Geiger fan, I was instantly drawn to it when I found out about it. This and the fact that Darkseed is one of those games where if you know exactly what to do, can be quite enjoyable. When it comes to such games, however, you have to be able to figure things out on your own, and this is where Darkseed fails. So, I would recommend it, but only if you're using a walkthrough or you have a lot of patience and no problems with things requiring trial and error. The game was successful enough to get a sequel, which was also pretty good. For one, it removed the time limit, so if you're not willing to put up with the first game's problems, you might want to check out the sequel. Next time on Obscure Room. Since Batman v Superman is coming out, next time I'm going to take a look at an obscure Batman game based on a 1989 Tim Burton movie. Let's hope I can finish it while it's still topical. Take care until your next visit to the Obscure Room. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you would like to see some more obscure retro reviews and some awesome video game music covers, you can click that subscribe button. You can also follow me on Twitter to find out about more obscure games, what I like and some other Twittery stuff. And you can take a look at some of my reviews down here. On the left we have my review of the terrible Castlevania MS-DOS port and on the right is my review of Chojin Sentai Jetman, which is more or less a Japanese Power Rangers game for the NES because it's based on the Super Sentai show Chojin Sentai Jetman. And if you're viewing this on a tablet or any kind of mobile device, all the links are in the description below.